Hi, I'm Safina and I'm from the Photojournalism Hub. Today we will be in conversation with Danny Burrows, who is a freelance photographer and writer. In 2015, he began a long-term project documenting the refugee crisis in Northern France entitled Indeterminate State. The project received wide recognition with photographs published in The Guardian, The Express, Huck Magazine, and The Prince were exhibited at World's Arts Contemporary Exhibition. Since 2018, he has been shooting a long-term project uh, which documents the Anabaptist Christian community of the Bruderhof. The project is currently on Kickstarter. So, hello, Danny. How are you today? Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you for joining us, especially on a Sunday. Oh, no, thank you for inviting me. It's great. You're welcome. Um, can you tell us how did you go from being an editor-in-chief to becoming a freelance photographer and writer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was uh, working for I was editor in chief of a, a pan European sports magazine um, based in Munich, and I guess 2013 was around the time that everything started going online, and uh, my my view of magazines at the time was to to make them more. Uh, coffee table more luxurious to invest more in paper and things whereas my publishing company thought that uh, making magazines more cheaply was the way to go to uh, sort of combat the um, exchange of advertising money from from online from magazines to online um, so I left <laughs> and I'd always wanted, I'd actually always wanted to be a, to be a photojournalist. It, it was something I did uh, while assisting actually in, in the uh, early, or sorry, the late 1990s. I was a fashion assistant to a photographer in London. And, um, but I used to shoot uh, my own photojournalism stories on the side. So, yeah, sorry, <laughs> very long answer. <laughs> you can take your time. Um, so what came first? Was it the writing or the photography? It was, I, I studied South American history to uh, do war journalism, actually. Um, so writing came first and then I went to London. I. I had been, I grew up in South America and Africa and then um, was studied, did my degree in, in Belize and, and the States. So I came back to London and sort of was hanging around with the crew in, in London who were into photography. So I, I started assisting a fashion photographer and um, really it, it just kind of developed. I, I thought, it would be an, because I was so into traveling and uh, I thought this is an amazing thing I can I can write and learn how to shoot photography and so I could do stories for magazines kind of cheaply because they would only have to send one person <laughs> wow. and uh, yeah being a, a an assistant was an incredible experience of or way to learn photography it's from flash and talking to people your subjects and yeah it's great do you often have a, do you often mentor for other photographers or do you have an assistant uh, I've never had an assistant I I always whenever anyone asks me to come along they're always welcome to come along um I love teaching photography actually in, in fact in in Calais uh, a friend of mine and I, Mark McAvoy, we set up um, a creative workshop in the, it was called um, the Kids Cafe, and it was in the jungle. Mm -hmm. um, so we were basically doing a creative course for the, um, for the miners there, who were kind of, they, they were always having cameras pointed at them. So we thought, you know, we we were guilty of it as well as as photojournalists. We, however, the two of us, kind of Mark and I, were staying in the camp. I think we did two years in the camp 
all together. And uh, anyway, so we thought it would be a great idea to teach these kids photography so that they would have agency of, over their own story. And also they could, you know, it gave them confidence because now rather than having cameras pointed at them, they could go and point the cameras at, at the, you know, big CRS guys in their art or body armor or, you know, photojournalists come in and they're like, oh, <laughs> take photographs of them. So it was, it was kind of uh, um, rebalancing the scales for them. It was really nice. And uh, I guess since then, I've, since lockdown actually, I've been doing an MA. So learned more about the history of photography and, and so really got the confidence to go out and teach. So I ended up teaching actually back at the uh, Bruderhof, who the project is about. Uh, they asked me to teach a, a course about ethical photography. So I went in there and taught the ethics of photography and then did a couple of um, things at my old school where I talked to the sixth form about moving into photojournalism. And then uh, my latest project is in uh, South London about infill building. So I went to the local school, which is Forest Hill. And uh, I thought, because I'm talking about their estate, it would be nice to get the kids from the school involved and, and really talking about what was their story, what is their story. They're, you know, they have to live through this infill building, which is robbing their estates of their green space. What is infill so, building, sorry? Oh, infill building is, um, you know, those beautiful old 19, from 1930s to 1950s estates, they all have those lovely green quadrangles. So it was all kind of built around the idea of giving people um, nice living space. Uh, however, during lockdown, the councils around London have sold off those green spaces because they owned the green spaces to build new flats. So whereas where you had a council estate with a green area like where kids could play or families could have barbecues and stuff, now they're going to stick up another high rise in the middle which deprives people of light and playing area. And you would think after, after, the, um, after the pandemic, we would have learned that these green spaces are very precious to us, but it's kind of, I suppose it's all about money and London's certainly short of housing. So they're kind of, hmm. uh, okay, that's surely a... there are more brownfield sites to Yeah. To <laughs> Yeah. I'm... Anyway, sorry, yeah. I was saying about the uh, students on these from Forest Hill School. So they're going to be creating their own stories about these infill uh, projects, and then I'm I'll come in and edit the work for them and and teach them how to put it into a magazine. And so it kind of gives them again, it's giving people agency over their own story and and allowing them to. Yeah, at the end of it, hopefully we'll make a little newspaper that they can distribute to their friends and kind of builds their confidence as photographers, but also gives them a voice. Absolutely. I love that. I love that when photography empowers any kind of art empowers young people or even if you're not young and you've come across it and you've never really learned how to truly express yourself and you find something that can. It's beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, I'm really inspired by uh, the French photographer, J.R., who kind of started off as, as this uh, street artist. And, you know, rather than put his photographs into galleries, he, he printed them out on huge black and white billboards and stuck them around the neighborhoods that he was uh, photographing in. So, you know, it was, it was kind of art for the people. It was more, it's a lot more democratic, which is, Something I want to do with that infill project as well is um, put up the images in in situ in these estates so people can look at them. It's not like they'll go to a gallery where wealthy people in suits are the people looking at the art and perhaps not realizing 
yes, a picture, one says framed is art, but it also should have a purpose. You know, it's, and I think if people give me their time as my subject and, you know, they, they pose for me as for a portrait or something and I'm, I'm involving myself in their story, you know, the least I can do is, is give something back, which is, you know, the prints on their estate or I don't know. Amazing. And you're creating incredible opportunities. You never know who, who's going to become what from it. Absolutely. It's, I mean, there's one of the, uh, the boys from the jungle, actually. He's, uh, he made it over to England and now lives in Brighton. And we're, all, um, we're still Facebooking each other. Oh, wow. He's the most amazing cricketer. Um, and I'm always like, oh, man, are you still keeping up with your photography? He's like, oh, I can't afford a camera, blah, blah, blah. So, but I know that, you know, the whole experience in the jungle for him was kind of, it was a, such a positive thing. Him and his mates running around with cameras with Mark and I just, you know, as these sort of peculiar mentors who <laughs> were. But, you know, he still talks about it. It's, it's great. You know, I'm sure if if he was able to get hold of a camera, he would he would, you know, document his life in some way. Or yeah, it's fun. Nice. Yeah. So um, I was going to ask you, you're currently kickstarting a project. How did that come about? Like, did you have an existing audience that you wanted to tap into, or did you just want what came about first? The idea that you wanted to make, create the book, or um, well, that project, as uh, as you said, it's about the Broodhof, um, mm -hmm. who are an Anabaptist Christian community, uh, and I met them actually in the jungle to start with and then um, contacted them. I ended up pestering them for about a year <laughs> before they allowed me into the community. And uh, at which point they, they were like, oh, well, 2020 is our centenary. Uh, maybe you can come in and you can photograph us so that you know, we, we document our life. Um, so it was kind of, and I said to them, I would love to make my own book on the side. So the images they asked for were very different to the ones I was really looking for. I was looking for more nuanced kind of story images. Um, and I, I, I kind of studied a bit of uh, pre-Raphaelite painting before because you know, it's, there's a, a lot of religious references in there. So it was all about light and, um, composition and so I'm, I got very carried away with that <laughs> so I spent my time running around looking for beautiful light in this community anyway sorry I digress <laughs> from the kickstarter I would love it to be a book uh, the Bruderhof made their own book um, which is really beautiful and um, but it wasn't it's not really the book I, I would wanted to make so then I went to uh, just before COVID actually I went there was a magnum uh, portfolio review in Venice mm. and I thought right I'm gonna go there <laughs> it was like I can't remember 800 pounds to for the ticket and the hotel and I was like um, Stu Smith from Ghost Books was there and you had to submit a portfolio and uh, to get accepted to the reviews. And I got this acceptance. I was like, right, that's it. I'm, I'm going to Venice. I'm going to present this project and it's gonna be seen by Magnum and, and, and Gost. And you know, I thought it was an incredible opportunity. You never really get to put your work in front of people of that standing within the industry, I suppose. It's very difficult uh, when you're starting out. So, I thought, right, I don't care how I'll get the money for this. I'll just rush over there. Anyway, got to Venice and um, the whole thing was done in alphabetical order. 
unfortunately I went out the first night and, and missed my chance to present my project the first one. <laughs> Come the end, end of this three-day symposium, everyone presented beautiful work. There, there were some incredible photographers there. And then uh, um, I, think, I think it was Jonas Bendixson from Magnum and uh, another guy from Magnum and then Stu Smith, they were like, okay, we're, we're off, we're going to the airport and kind of heading off with their wheelie bags. And I was like, oh, I haven't presented my project yet. So they were like, oh, okay, well, you know, we've got half an hour. So I laid out all the images on the floor and, and they got, everyone got really stuck in, because I had printed out a stack of images as sort of A5. So I, we laid them all out and then um, Stuart was like, uh, okay, I really love your, love your project. I've got to go to the airport. Uh, would you like to come to my house on Sunday and, and we'll do an edit? I was like, oh, oh my God, I, you know, I think I just got invited to Stu Smith's house to do an edit of the book. You know, I, um, so I had a couple of celebratory drinks that night <laughs> and then went to Stu's house and you know, it, it's kind of, it was born then, but then we had COVID and lockdowns and um, difficulties with funding. And so anyway, it's come to now funding the book on Kickstarter um, to get it printed with Ghost. Uh, Printing with Ghost is, is an exp it's an expensive thing. Uh, Stuart loves his expensive papers and beautiful covers and you know the books are stunning that Ghost makes. So it costs a lot of money, I suppose. <laughs> oh, I'm running out of power. Hold on. Yeah, so it's ended up being a Kickstarter campaign, which we're running at the moment. Okay, so going back uh, just a step, you said that you um, it took you a year to get access to the community. What was it about them that made you not want to give up? I, I suppose having just, you know, we were coming off the back of, there was the Iraq war and there was Syria and the whole world seemed to be falling apart. You know, we were covering the, the uh, refugee crisis in, in Northern France and just all these hideous experiences of mankind were happening. And, you know, there, there was a lot of, sort of negative press towards refugees. And so it was all of a sudden I met these people who had sent their teenagers to uh, sort clothing in a in a warehouse in Calais. Yeah. You know, they, they were there in very conservative dress and they were really lovely um, young people who were doing a, a great thing. And I was like, wow, these, this is really interesting. So I, as soon as I got home from Calais that, that week, I, I guess I was staying for a week that week. And I looked them up and I was like, you know, it was, pacifists I was like oh wow that's you know <laughs> kind of uh in opposition to this horrible permanent state of war that we seem to be in and then I read about uh their community of goods and wealth so they all live in community and no one has personal possessions and um I guess <laughs> it all sounded very idyllic having just spent far too long in, in refugee camps and kind of being depressed about the whole um, state of war that the, the world was in. So yeah, that's why I was stuck at it. I was like, wow, I would love to, uh, to get into this community and, and really see what community life is, you know, what, how they're living this life of, of uh, having no possessions and no technologies and, you know, not having a no one has uh phones on the community so you're like wow this is quite incredible it's uh yeah and i was 
taken by the idea of actually being able to go and live in in these communities i guess i i went there i'd actually i think in 2015 i went to uh fabrica which is the creative arm of benetton and i did a workshop there uh where giles dooley was the incredible photographer was um lecturing and and then all these other amazing photographers and I just realized then that I was I wasn't I was shooting pictures but I wasn't um being a photographer or as as a photographer should be you know telling stories and um I guess it was the the whole um responsibility of having a camera that I learned there you know, because the, it is quite a weapon, really. And all of a sudden, I, I began, began to think about the camera differently and that, you know, photography should be more collaborative. It's not just about pointing my, my camera at someone. It's, it's about working with them. It becomes more of a circle, you know, or a relationship between the people you're, you're photographing. And I think that's where photography gets better. Um, so <laughs> I, I uh, had decided that Calais was going to be this thing I wanted to cover because I, having grown up in around the world and only having just moved to the UK and then having this really horrible white right wing reaction to refugees trying to come into the country you know I, it was i found it so offensive <laughs> oh. so i was like i actually want to go there and tell find out what's going on and tell people's stories in an honest way and you know maybe try and change some of that rhetoric i guess I, it was a bit highfalutin i was like right i'm gonna go and <laughs> you know, tell people's stories and but um while we were there because I, my old magazine was winter sports mm -hmm. i was there in the winter and everyone was cold and wet and intense and you know i was cold and or actually i had nice jacket from my snowboarding days so i was like oh hold on everyone gets all this kit for free if you're a professional snowboarder or skier or mountaineer and if i can get everyone's old jackets maybe I can just collect them all and hand them out in in the camp so I we were like okay how are we going to do this okay we'll we'll create a little NGO called it was called Riders for Refugees and we were like and I put out an email and then all of a sudden um everyone kind of jumped on it all these incredible people out in the mountains all over Europe started sending me all this kit and I was in and I mean, I, you couldn't move in, in my little house. It was full of boxes and, and amazing companies like Quicksilver and Patagonia oh, were wow. sending massive boxes of seconds or, or even brand new stuff from last season that they hadn't sold. And I, I was just going to Calais and just distributing all this amazing Gore-Tex uh, jackets, you know, and so everyone was wandering around in Burton Snowboard's jackets and, and Patagonia jackets. And I was like, oh, you know, this is a really good thing. Mm. And eventually, so it's actually snowballed and, and uh, Riders for Refugees is way out of my hands now. It's managed down in Annecy. And so, but it, I think, you know, they distributed about three and a half thousand snowboard and ski jackets last year from the Balkans all the way to Greek islands to, you know, across France. So yes, to, to cut a long story short, I was there as a photographer, but I realized that there was something else I could do. So yeah, we ended up volunteering and, and doing that. Amazing, that's amazing. Well, good for you. That sounds really, really great. I love it when I hear that photographers aren't just taking pictures, but they are, you know, part of a bigger movement. I, I think it's, um, I mean, Giles Dooley is a 
perfect example of that is, you know, he he was injured in in Afghanistan in 2013, I think. Um, and he started a, a charity called Legacy of War. And it's supportive of um, in fact, his books, uh, One Second of Life, really beautiful book. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's all about raising awareness of, of um, the victims of war rather than war itself. So, you know, and he himself is a victim of war, having he, he lost both legs and an arm in stepping on an IED. But, you know, at the moment he's in Ukraine uh, photographing the victims of war and, wow, if, if a photographer can go that far and, you know, become a, an advocate for, for peace and, and sort of represent people who, who are unable to represent themselves. So, yeah, I think it's a really worthy thing. <laughs> Well, I think that's what photojournalism hub is all about. It's about uh, human rights and social justice. So they're doing an incredible job. Tinsley has, has really created quite something. It's a real oh. and an honour to to work with her. Absolutely, Tinsley is doing an incredible job. I I was so honoured when when she asked me to to do this, and yeah, that's that's great. It's amazing. Yeah. So, um, just to where can people find you? If they want to find out more about the um oh, the project mm -hmm. uh on instagram which is at danny burrows photo um i've been inundating instagram with, with things about kickstarter um trying to trying to get funds together uh also on kickstarter i think it's if you look up uh, together brackets a and then part it's on there, um, and also um, on Facebook, which I think is Danny Burrow's photo as well. Yeah. So, how have you found the social media has helped you or hindered you? Um, I think probably Instagram has been the most helpful, um, but. I've found that uh, doing the Kickstarter, I think, I think uh, doing a book on, on a religious community is a really hard thing to do. Had I been doing a book on, uh, on cars, I think the audience would be enormous. Um, but I think it, you know, it's a difficult sell because I'm, the way I look at it is the book is a, is a work of art in itself. It's irrelevant whether the community it's about is a religious community. It's going, you know, it's about having a, being given a visual narrative of a community that you don't know about. Um, in a beautifully bound book on beautiful paper and you know and I think hopefully people will buy it because it's well shot it's a you know it's by goss books and it's going to be a beautiful thing and and also it'll because no one knows much about this community it is kind of like the first time someone will get a visual essay about these people and yes they're they're a, a uh, christian community but you know, this i think we've got so much to learn from these communities like the uh, the pacifism element is is quite appealing and and also the whole community of goods and wealth and rejection of of uh, mass consumerism and reliance on social media <laughs> and there I am relying on social media to sell it which is quite ironic um but I think really the the most effective tool in getting this 
Kickstarter out there is is really um, contacting people directly. I think that's that's and being able to say things like that rather than someone on online having a look and they they might see a pretty picture and and then see underneath oh Anabaptist Christian community and go oof I have I want nothing to do with religion. So yeah, it's being able to talk to people really, I guess, which you, you don't get to do on social media. It's kind of, it's like throwing a ball in the sea, isn't it? <laughs> and hoping someone picks it up. Hmm. Are you planning on having a book launch then once it gets uh, published? Oh God, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to have a party in London. <laughs> uh, yeah, always the, don't need an excuse. <laughs> it would be, it would be so nice. I mean, it would be amazing to do it. Um, I don't know. It might be nice to do it on the community as well, where we put up prints on the community and they invite people in to see the prints. Might be a nice way to do it. Or, I don't know. I didn't, I mean, the photography as an industry is a, is a funny thing, isn't it? It's how does one become a name in photography if you're not putting big, beautiful prints on a gallery wall and having it seen by the right people? Um, I don't know. I think that's probably the most difficult thing for photographers these days is actually getting into the market you know once you've once you've created a beautiful book or and it's been accepted and seen and all of a sudden you're at photo london and rah, you know, then then you're on your bike and racing but it's actually just kind of getting seen to begin with you know i that's why i ended up spend throwing that money in on going to Venice and seeing if I could get my project in front of people and I don't know it's uh yeah <laughs> it's difficult I think it's really photography is a really hard business for people to succeed in what would you like people to know about the Anabaptist Christian community or the Bruderhof um um, I guess I'm, I want to share the experience I had. Um, being a conservative Christian movement or community, there they have views which I personally don't hold. But uh, I think being a photographer, you know, you've got to. You're there to document. You're there to to be an observer and, and also be neutral because, you know, if you go, go in there and you're like, well, you know, I, I believe in gay marriage, which I do. They don't. And I, I had that discussion with people, you know, I do disagree with your views on this. And the thing about being in there is I was able to, I was able to have these conversations. They were really open. Um, they were, I thought it would be a really difficult thing getting in there and kind of fitting in and, and being able to take pictures. But actually it was so easy. I, I remember the first week I was there, um, someone said, oh, can you not take pictures the first few days? So I wore my camera around it. You know, and the first night uh, I went to, someone invited me to a barbecue next to this amazing natural swimming pool on one of the communities. It's like, well, this is pretty good. I can go for a swim in the morning. And uh, we were chatting away about all sorts of things because they're, they're really open. They're very well educated. You know, they know about the world around them. Yes, they live in these closed communities, but they're all about, um, really putting their religion into practice. So they do a lot of charitable work and 
you know, it's when you're a teenager and you're un, or an unmarried adult, you're always pushed out there to go and do charity work and stuff. So they know about the world. They know what's going on. And anyway, I was sitting there at this barbecue and, and the guy kind of leans over and goes, oh, do you fancy a beer? And I was like, hold on. <laughs> I thought this was a, a, a Christian, like, conservative Christian movement. It's like, yeah, but we're German. Of course we drink beer. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. They gave me the most amazing homemade IPA. And, you know, I think that's the thing. Everyone has these preconceived ideas of, of what a closed religious community is. Then I think the most asked question I got coming out and saying I was doing this project is, oh, is it a cult? You know, are they trying to convert you? And you're like, uh, no, I went in there saying that, you know, yes, I believe in good and evil, but I'm not, not in a formal church. <laughs> you know, they knew, they knew my uh, persuasion, but they still allowed me in and they were very open. And uh, I think that's what I want to get across is that, you know, Yes, we've, we've all got these preconceived ideas about religious groups, but until you've actually got in there and, and experienced it, yes, it, listen to the, the things you don't agree with, but then experience the amazing thing, you know, like children growing up without devices. So they're, they're able to be kids, you know, then it's amazing. They charge around these, these communities barefoot and like ah, climbing trees and you know their schools are all about getting out between lessons and it's very much outdoorsy and and knowing what the world's about and what animals are about and mm. so yeah it's I guess it's breaking down preconceived ideas is about community that's what I want to get across and okay. yeah I love the pacifism and I love their approach to shared community space and community of goods and wealth. I mean, gosh, we can all learn from that and not being so reliant on things and yeah. So um, what are you going to do next? Will you, um, will you cover another religious community, do you think? Uh, I've, I'm doing this project in Lewisham on the infill building. Um, sorry, that's my washing machine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm doing the project on the infill building um, and working with the, the children at, at the, uh, or young adults, I suppose, A-level students at uh, Forest Hill School. Um, and then I, planned maybe to go to Ukraine uh, September, October. Um, I've always got this list of uh, projects that I'm like, oh, wow, I would love to get involved in that. So yeah, always kind of researching different things. I was doing a project about uh, Airsoft, which is um, people who dress up as soldiers and play war on the weekends with these BB guns. Mm -hmm. which I was really intrigued by because growing up in, in South America and Africa, you know, people with guns <laughs> and war is a real thing. It's, it's not something you go and play as an adult with yeah. BB guns. <laughs> so, yeah. And, um, yeah, there are a whole bunch of things I've got in the book. <laughs> amazing well thank you so much for your time is there anything else that you'd like to add before we leave no i think i think i probably rambled on <laughs> quite enough to bore everyone to death <laughs> so uh no but thank you so much for for having me on and and uh yeah allowing me to present this kickstarter project well thank you we wish you all the best of luck with that and really hope you. You, really really hope that you meet your target yeah so, me too thank you thank you